What if I told you, the moment a captured American fighter roared into German skies, it shattered everything the Luftwaffe believed about air superiority. This wasn't just another plane, it was faster, deadlier, and built with a power the Germans couldn't even imagine. And when their test pilots realized the truth, fear replaced confidence. Don't scroll because what happened next will change how you see the air war forever. On a bitter July morning in 1944, the skies above northern Norway carried a secret neither side expected. Lieutenant Matali of the Royal Navy's fleet air arm gripped the controls of his Corsair fighter, heart pounding as his engine coughed its last breaths. The aircraft, serial number JT-404, wasn't just a machine, it was a symbol of American engineering power, and now it was falling helplessly into enemy hands. Below stretched German-occupied territory. Capture here didn't mean glory. It meant interrogation and perhaps worse. With his altitude fading and the propeller slowing to a crawl, Matali had one desperate option left. Bring the bird down in a rough Norwegian field near Bodo. What followed was not just a crash landing, but the beginning of a story that left German aviation experts both fascinated and deeply unsettled. For the first time, they stood face to face with one of America's most formidable warbirds, the F-4U Corsair. This bent-wing fighter wasn't just another aircraft. It was a technological leap, one that had already begun tilting the balance of the air war across the Pacific. As German engineers combed through its design, questions rattled through their minds. How had the Americans built a naval fighter that could not only outpace but outfight some of the Luftwaffe's best? And if this machine ever appeared in European skies, what chance would their own pilots have? To answer those questions, we need to rewind the clock to 1938, when the U.S. Navy laid down a challenge that seemed almost impossible. They demanded a carrier-based fighter capable of breaking the 400 mile per hour barrier, a speed unheard of for naval aircraft at the time. Back then, most carrier fighters barely scraped past 350 miles per hour. Add the weight of folding wings, heavy landing gear and reinforced frames, and speed seemed doomed from the start. But the contract fell into the hands of Chance Vought Corporation and one visionary designer, Rex Beisel. Beisel knew conventional thinking wouldn't work. To meet the Navy's audacious demand, his team had to rewrite the rules of aviation. The result? A radical design that would forever etch itself into history. The inverted gull wing of the Corsair. This wasn't for looks, it was engineering born of necessity. The Navy wanted the biggest, most powerful engine available, the Pratt & Whitney R2800 Double Wasp. An 18-cylinder monster delivering over 2,000 horsepower, and with it came a giant propeller, more than 13 feet in diameter. But that oversized propeller posed a deadly question. How do you fit it onto a carrier fighter without making the landing gear dangerously tall and unstable? The answer would create one of the most iconic silhouettes of World War II. The Corsair's greatest challenge was not in the air, but on the ground. How could you fit a propeller so massive, over 13 feet across, onto a carrier fighter without forcing the landing gear to be dangerously tall and fragile? The answer came from Rex Beisel's boldest idea yet, the inverted gull wing. By angling the wings down and then back upward, the design allowed the landing gear to sit at the wing's lowest point. This gave the Corsair just enough clearance for its giant propeller while keeping the landing legs strong and short and as a bonus it reduced drag where the wing met the fuselage, an elegant solution hidden in plain sight. When the prototype XF4U-1 first took to the skies on May 29, 1940, the results stunned even its creators. Test pilot Lyman Bullard pushed the machine to 404 miles per hour, making it the very first American fighter to break the 400 mark in level flight. At a time when Germany's BF-109s and Britain's Spitfires were still struggling below 360, the Corsair wasn't just fast, it was rewriting the definition of speed. But speed was only the beginning. The Corsair introduced innovations years ahead of its rivals. Fully retractable landing gear hidden inside smooth enclosed wells. Oil coolers seamlessly blended into the wings and a clean aerodynamic profile that left almost no unnecessary drag. And then, there was the firepower, six 50 caliber Browning machine guns, three mounted in each wing, each fed with 400 rounds, a storm of heavy fire that could shred enemy bombers or fighters alike in just seconds. 
Few aircraft of its era carried such concentrated and reliable striking power. Yet this revolutionary fighter came with a curse. The same long nose that gave it speed and power left pilots nearly blind during carrier landings. From the cockpit, the runway, or the rolling deck of an aircraft carrier was almost invisible during the final approach. By late 1942, the Navy faced a grim dilemma. The Corsair was too dangerous for carrier operations. After a string of near disasters, the Navy reluctantly grounded it from carrier decks, turning instead to the safer but less radical F-6F Hellcat. The Corsair, once envisioned as the Navy's crown jewel, was handed off to the Marine Corps. At first it seemed like a rejection, but in truth it was fate. The Marines desperately needed a modern fighter. They were still flying outdated Wildcats, hopelessly outmatched against faster and higher flying Japanese planes. The Corsair's exile to the Marines would soon change the balance of power in the Pacific. In February 1943, Marine Squadron VMF-124 landed at Henderson Field on Guadalcanal. The Cactus Air Force had been fighting tooth and nail to keep the skies clear, often losing altitude battles against Japanese bombers. On February 14, 1943, the Corsair entered combat for the very first time. A formation of B-24 bombers, escorted by Army P-38 Lightnings, P-40 Warhawks, and Marine Corsairs, ran headlong into Japanese fighters. The result was sobering. Eight American aircraft went down, including two Corsairs. It was not the debut anyone had hoped for, but in war, greatness is not measured by first impressions. It's forged through resilience, because in the months ahead, the Corsair would prove itself not as a failed experiment, but as one of the most feared fighters of the entire the Second World War. The taste of combat was rocky. On its debut mission in February 1943, one of the brand new fighters collided with a Japanese Zero. The result? A loss that hardly lived up to the legend everyone had hoped for. But the Marines were quick learners. They realized that the Corsair wasn't built for slow-turning dogfights. Against nimble Japanese fighters, that was a losing game. Instead, pilots leaned into the Corsair's greatest gift, raw power. High-speed slashing attacks, fast climbs, and dives so steep they left opponents gasping. This became the Corsair's playbook. Strike hard, break away, and return before the enemy even had time to react. One man, Lieutenant Kenneth Walsh of VMF-124, would prove just how deadly the new fighter could be. Walsh was no rookie. He had been flying marine aircraft since before the war. And on May 13, 1943, he unleashed the Corsair's true potential, downing three Japanese aircraft in a single mission. In that moment, the bent wing bird earned its first ace. Word spread fast. Among Allied pilots, whispers grew that this was the fighter they had been waiting for. Among Japanese aviators, something else spread, unease. The Corsair could outclimb, outrun, and outdive them. For the first time in the Pacific War, the hunters found themselves the hunted. And then came the sound. The Corsair's unique engine-propeller combination produced an eerie, high-pitched whistle during dives. Japanese pilots began to dread it. They gave the aircraft a name, Whistling Death. It wasn't just a nickname. It was a warning. By the end of 1943, the Corsair had flipped the script entirely. Marine pilots racked up an astonishing kill ratio of 11 to 1 against Japanese aircraft, a level of dominance rarely seen in air combat. The fighter that had once been rejected by the Navy was now rewriting the Pacific skies, but the Corsair was more than just a dogfighter. Its rugged frame and monstrous engine made it an exceptional fighter bomber, it could haul bombs and rockets into combat, pound enemy positions on the ground, and still go toe-to-toe -to -toe with enemy aircraft on the return flight. In an era of specialized designs, this versatility was pure gold. For Marine commanders struggling in island-hopping campaigns, the Corsair became a miracle machine. Escort fighter, bomber, interceptor, and scout, all in one. Yet even as the Marines unlocked the Corsair's full potential, far across the world, another air war was raging. In Europe, German engineers were dissecting every piece of intelligence they could gather on American aircraft. They had already studied the Mustang, the Thunderbolt, and the Lightning. But the Corsair? It remained a mystery. Whispers from the Pacific hinted at a fighter of terrifying speed and unmatched firepower, but to the Luftwaffe, it was just rumor. 
Their top pilots flying the latest Messerschmitt Bf 109s and Focke-Wulf 190s believed they still ruled the skies. That confidence would soon be tested, because one cold morning in Norway, a single downed Corsair would fall into German hands. And when their experts finally examined it up close, they were stunned. By 1944, German pilots believed they still held their ground in the skies of Europe. The Messerschmitt Bf 109 was sleek and deadly. The Focke-Wulf 190 was rugged, powerful, and feared by Allied pilots since its debut. Together, they had long been symbols of German air superiority. But whispers from the Pacific unsettled them. Reports spoke of an American fighter that sounded almost mythical. A bent-winged beast that could soar past 440 miles per hour, climb like a rocket, and unleash a storm of six heavy machine guns. To the Luftwaffe, it sounded exaggerated. Perhaps the Japanese were exaggerating their defeats, or perhaps this new fighter only seemed formidable against less experienced opponents. Then came July 1944. Lieutenant Matali's Corsair crash-landed in Norway, and for the first time Germany had its hands on one of these mysterious machines. The aircraft was carefully shipped first to Narvik, then on to Germany's premier testing ground at Recklin. Here, the Luftwaffe's experts had pulled apart and flown nearly every Allied aircraft they'd captured. Spitfires, Hurricanes, Mustangs, Thunderbolts, even Soviet fighters from the Eastern Front. Each test followed the same routine. Inspect, fly, compare and adapt tactics. Most of the time they found compromises. Weight penalties here, manufacturing shortcuts there. But the Corsair was different. From the very first inspection, German engineers were struck by its refinement. The fuselage gleamed with advanced aerodynamics. The all-metal frame was rugged yet elegant. And then there was the engine, Pratt & Whitney's R2800 Double Wasp. At 2,000 horsepower, it dwarfed the power plants of Germany's frontline fighters. The DB605 in the BF109 barely managed 1,450. Even the BMW801 of the FW190 peaked at around 1,700. Suddenly, German engineers realized they were staring at a power gap of nearly 50%. When their test pilots finally took the Corsair into the sky, doubts melted into unease. The reports were startling. Faster in level flight than any German fighter. Climb rates that matched or exceeded their best interceptors. The rugged frame that could endure punishing G-forces without buckling. And the firepower. Six 50-caliber Brownings, delivering streams of high-velocity rounds that could tear through aircraft with alarming ease. For the Luftwaffe, it was a sobering moment. The Corsair wasn't just a fighter. It was proof that America had entered a new era of industrial and engineering dominance. Unlike earlier Allied aircraft, this was no compromised design. It was sophisticated, powerful, and mass-producible. The implications were chilling. If America could field thousands of machines like this, the balance of the air war would tilt even further, leaving German pilots outpaced, outgunned, and overwhelmed. But by the summer of 1944, it was already too late. German factories were crippled by bombing raids, raw materials were running out, and desperate resources were being funneled into experimental jets. There would be no new piston-engine fighter to rival the Corsair. Meanwhile, across the world, Corsair squadrons carved their legend in the Pacific, escorting bombers, pounding island fortresses, and sweeping Japanese fighters from the skies. Its versatility and brutal effectiveness made it one of the defining aircraft of the war. The Corsair that fell in Norway was more than just wreckage. To German engineers, it was a revelation, and to history, it was evidence of a shift in global power. A preview of the age to come, when American aerospace innovation would set the standard for decades. And for the Luftwaffe, the Corsair was not just a machine, it was a warning. Imagine being a German aviation engineer in the summer of 1944. You've tested Spitfires, Mustangs, Thunderbolts, captured Allied machines that were fast, well-armed, and dangerous, yes. But predictable, you thought you understood the enemy's limits. Then the Corsair arrived. The F-4U wasn't just another fighter. It was a revelation, an aircraft so advanced, so brutally effective, that even hardened Luftwaffe test pilots stepped out of its cockpit in stunned silence. The first shock came under the hood. The Americans hadn't simply bolted on a bigger engine. They had created the Pratt & Whitney R-2800 Double Wasp, 
a technological leap producing more power than anything Germany could mass produce. At over 2,000 horsepower, it delivered not only raw speed but also unmatched reliability, something German engineers knew they could no longer guarantee in their own factories scarred by shortages and bombing raids. Then came the wings. That strange inverted gull wing wasn't some stylistic flourish. It was a masterpiece of problem-solving, giving ground clearance for a massive propeller while keeping drag low. Even the landing gear impressed. Rotating 90 degrees as it folded away with engineering elegance, Germany had never attempted. And when the test flights began, that's when admiration turned into unease. The Corsair roared past 440 miles per hour, outpacing Germany's finest. It climbed like a rocket, sustaining performance long after a Messerschmitt or Fokkerwolf would begin to fade. In combat trials, it showed the ability to dive, climb or roll at will, dictating every fight, choosing when to strike and when to vanish. One veteran test pilot summed it up bluntly. This machine can fight on its own terms. Ours cannot. Even its firepower raised alarm. 650 caliber machine guns didn't carry the explosive punch of German cannons, but their long range, high velocity, and devastating rate of fire meant that Allied pilots could shred targets before a Luftwaffe ace even got close enough to shoot back. And perhaps the most sobering discovery, the Corsair wasn't just powerful, it was easy to fly. Unlike the temperamental BF-109 or the unforgiving FW-190, this machine forgave mistakes. That meant American pilots could be trained faster, fly harder, and survive longer. And here's the kicker. The Corsair captured in Norway wasn't even the latest model. Reports hinted that newer versions, with even more powerful engines, were already rolling off American production lines in staggering numbers. For Germany's test pilots and engineers, the truth was undeniable. This wasn't just an aircraft. It was a symbol, a warning, that the age of American air dominance had arrived. And no matter how skilled the Luftwaffe's pilots were, the skies of the future would belong to machines like the F-4U Corsair. By late 1944, German aviation experts were facing a bitter truth. The skies that once belonged to the Luftwaffe were slipping away. Not because their pilots lacked courage or skill, but because the machines they flew could no longer keep pace with the enemies. The captured Corsair at Rechlin drove that point home with brutal clarity.